of Time community, and welcome to the Wheel of Time pod through. I'm Teresa. And I'm Tim. And together, we're going to walk through Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. How are you doing today, Tim? I'm doing pretty good. It's been a busy day, but we're going to sit down and do a podcast, so yay! Dude, this is our 15th episode. Yeah, How 15th. crazy is that? That is. We're more than halfway done with mm-hmm. the Eye of the World. Yep. Like, that's just crazy. Yeah, like... It this has been a fun ride. It has, but it, I mean, it's been a lot of work and I realize that we've done a lot of episodes, but it doesn't feel like we've done 15. Like, that's a lot. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Anyway, yeah, so I'm excited. I'm good. All right. Well, before we get started, we just want to remind you that this is a reread. We assume that you've read the entire series, so there will be spoilers. You have been warned. So, Tim. What are we going to be doing in today's episode? In this episode, we're going to be covering chapters 29 and 30, where things go to crap for Eggwen and Pirin. They really do. <laughs> so chapter 29 is called Eyes Without Pity, and the icon is the wolf. All right, here's a quick summary of chapter 29 to act as a reminder for those of you who are not reading along with us. Elias sets a quick pace as he, Perrin, and Eggwen travel across the Caroline grass that leaves the Ammons fielders exhausted and tense. He won't say what has him on edge, and even the wolves don't know what his deal is, but they sense his urgency and scout for the group. The land changes to rolling hills, and Elias insists on creeping cautiously over each ridge before he gives them the clearance to cross. Crouching low on one of the ridges, they spot a gigantic flock of ravens, the Dark One's eyes, searching. Those ravens are joined by even more until there are hundreds of ravens flying, hunting them. Elias knows a place of safety if they can only get there before they are discovered by the ravens, and so they run. The ravens attack animals along the way, and the humans see vivid examples of what is in store for them if the ravens catch them. Suddenly, Perrin can sense the wolves behind them, engaging another huge flock of ravens in battle. The wolves survive, but are injured. With ravens in the front and behind, they have no choice but to press on toward Elias's safe place. The situation is looking dire, and Perrin decides that when the time comes, he won't let Egwin die in pieces like the animals the ravens have killed. He will use his axe first. And then they cross some invisible barrier, and he feels a change. Elias explains that they are in an abandoned Ogier setting, and they are safe from shadow spawn. No creature of the Dark One will willingly enter, and the One Power doesn't work here either. Egwin feels uncomfortable there. But they are safe for the moment and can take a minute to recover from their exhaustion. Now that the danger has passed, Perrin is beating himself up over ever entertaining the idea of killing Egwin. He is overcome by his gloominess and retreats into silence. They notice that a huge rock near their camp looks like an eye, and Elias tells them that it is the ruin of a great statue of Arter Hawkwing, the high king that united all the lands. Hawkwing brought peace and justice to the land with fire and sword for any who opposed him, but the common people loved him. Hawkwing was going to build his capital city in that setting where no one could channel because he hated Aes Sedai so much. The people built a monument to him, but Hawkwing died on the very day the statue was completed. Those in his bloodline squabbled and fought so much over who would be his successor that his empire crumbled to ruin and launched the War of Hundred Years, and now all that is left is this crumbling statue in the middle of nowhere, forgotten by time. So Elias is tripping. He's totally paranoid, but not saying why. Right. He just keeps driving them on, trying to make sure that they're not seen, but not explaining what he's trying to not be seen by. Yeah. Um... So, in my opinion, this could have just been another, and now we run for our lives sequence that we've seen in other chapters. Right. Uh, but, well, it's effectively the same thing. We're covering ground and running from danger, the, but the tone is different. It's so much more suspenseful than uh-huh. the other sequences. Yeah. Um, it just keeps getting ratcheted up as we go and we go. And I think it's effectively done really, really well. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, Robert Jordan's really good at riding tension. So this chapter where they're being hunted is right up his alley. Mm-hmm. And then Eggwin, <laughs> we get this moment, one of my favorite ones, and never, I never failed to laugh at this. She, Eggwin sticks her tongue out of Elias fr- from right. behind, and he can't see as he's, like, pushing them on, and she's just like, well, Bleh. 
Yeah. She's still very, yeah. very young. <laughs> so after they see the, the, the ravens take flight for the first time, they, they, they see them ahead of them. A parent asks Elias why the wolves didn't see the birds that were lying in wait, because they had mm-hmm. gone ahead of them. Um, and his response is, wolves don't look up in trees much. Well, neither do humans, if every scary movie or TV show I've ever seen is to be believed. I know, right? Um, but So what I'm trying to get at is that wolves are not that different from humans in the way they regard the world. I mean, they don't look up. Yeah, I totally agree. As someone who's arachnophobic and super paranoid about spiders, I always scan the ceiling and the like walls up in the high corners. So I'm always looking up. But you're right. Anytime you see a a uh, suspenseful TV show or movie or like a horror movie, people are always getting the drop on um, the the innocent bystanders from above because no one looks up. That's why we call it getting the drop on them. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so watching the fox get attacked yeah. and realizing that that's what will happen to them if they're caught by the ravens, is terrifying. Absolutely. And it's exactly what I mean when I talk about how well the chapter is written. It was the same thing back in chapter five when Rand is sneaking back to the farmhouse when the Trollocs are there. Mm-hmm. And he touches the wetness oh, of yeah. the sheep's wool when it's covered in blood. And he realizes the animals have been slaughtered. It's this visceral thing. It's it's disgust yeah. and terror all wrapped up in this perfect stressful bow. And it's oh it's just done so well. So creepy. Yeah. Also, drinking game, take a shot every time we say Raven in this episode. <laughs> I don't want to go to the hospital. <laughs> I don't, yeah, don't don't actually don't do, that. do it. Don't do that. Yeah. Wow. Drink response. Anyway. <laughs> so uh the part where Egwin kills the raven with the slingshot. Oh, yeah. That's one more reminder that she is not a damsel in distress. As much as Elias dismisses her and ignores her and Perrin underestimates her, she will not be counted out. Yeah, she totally, like, saves their butts from being discovered when she kills that raven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Perrin makes a real strong connection with the wolves pretty much for the first time. And he experiences the pain that the ravens... uh, are inflicting on them when they attack the wolves. Mm-hmm. Um, after this happens, Elias kind of stares Perrin down until he admits that he can communicate with the wolves. He He's scared. I mean, Perrin doesn't understand it and wants to make sense of it. And it takes this moment with them running for their lives and finally having a pause for him to f- admit that out loud that he can talk to the wolves. It kind of seemed like a crappy thing for Elias to do, though. Yeah, you know, it's it like was. don't out other people. And I know that Elias didn't actually out Perrin exactly, but it was it's, it's it was a very fine line, and it just felt kind of scummy to me. Yeah, like the the idea that hey, maybe you can talk to the wolves has been pitched, but it wasn't like and you can talk to the wolves, mm-hmm. and there's no going back from this point. It's like Perrin has to like in front of Egwin admit the wolves are saying this. Right. And it's completely, there's no getting around. The wolves can talk to Perrin. Yeah. And Perrin can talk but to Perrin the wolves. wasn't ready to admit that, not only to himself, but especially not to Egwin. Right. And so Elias kind of pressuring him there, it just, uh, it was not good. No, no. But, okay, so as far as the uh, wolves, the wolves uh, being attacked by the ravens. Oh, yeah. I love this line. Wolves don't die as easily as foxes, and they had a mission. It's such a simple sentence, but I love what it says about the wolves. Yeah. It just really stood out to me. It's like, wow, yep. Like the power of the wolves, you know? Yeah. So, Elias. (laughs) He's (laughs) trying to spur them on, and he says... (laughs) Keep moving, burn you. Think you'll do any better than that fox did if they catch us? The one with its insides piled on its head? (laughs) (laughs) Elias, ever the comforting presence. (laughs) Oh, wow. I love the way he talks. He cracks me up. (laughs) So they're running and they're running and they finally enter the setting. And Perrin feels a little refreshed instantly, while Egwin feels on edge. Yeah, so this is what the book says. 
Egwin reined in Bella and looked around uncertainly, half wondering and half fearful. It's strange, she whispered. I feel as if I lost something. And later Elias explains that no Ace and I will go into the setting. Uh, he says, the one power won't work here. They can't touch the true source. Can't even feel the source, like it's vanished. Makes the mitch inside, that does. Gives them the shakes like a seven-day drunk. It's safety. <laughs> <laughs> it's safety. Uh, so the thing that interested me about this is that Perrin, with, with all his broodiness, um, he feels relieved and refreshed the instant they cross the border into the, into the state. Right. Like his legs feel a little less worn out and all that other fun stuff. Uh-huh. But Egwin immediately is on edge because she can no longer sense the power. Right. Now, she can't consistently channel enough to light a candle on her own. Right. <laughs> but it still sets her on edge, the sense of the loss of the source. It's That is interesting because, I mean, she's only just discovered that she can channel. I right. mean, she probably is only known for, at this point, two weeks, give or take. Right. Um, but already she can feel the absence, which is really interesting to think about. There's a lot of in- implications there. Yeah. Not yeah. going to go into it in this episode, but there's a lot of implications. So. Yeah. So Perrin is such a broody pants. Yeah. Like, he's such a <laughs> buzzkill and, like, a mopey emo kid. Like, when he's um, getting down on himself for uh, thinking about uh, Mercy killing Egwin. Yeah. <laughs> this is what he says, and this is the voice that I hear it in. Would you have saved her? Would you have cut her down like so many bushes? Bushes don't bleed, do they? Or scream and look in your eyes and ask why? It just it reads like bad poetry. He's so gloomy. Or a scene from the, you know, WB back in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> this week on Dawson's Creek. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just I he just throws his hand over her eyes it collapses just uh. Uh, oh Perrin oh Perrin woe is me I will now blog about this exactly yes <laughs> so as Perrin is being all broody uh, they're <laughs> sitting in the setting and they see the statue and we get the right. story about uh, Arthur Harkwing yeah um, and what I love about it is how it's a parallel to Alexander the Great mm-hmm. you know Arthur Harkwing held a grand empire and maintained a sort of peace uh, through might um, until he died and then it passes to his descendants, who messed it all up. At least that's how this story goes, the way that, they w- that it's told. Elias gives a slightly different perspective on there, which just more kind of reinforces that whole... Yeah, I, I like that. You know, I like how um, sort of the legend of Arthur Hawkwing is that he was, you know, he brought peace to the land and, and justice and yada yada. Whereas Elias is like, um, with vengeance and blood and <laughs> fighting and war... <laughs> Like, 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 you it, understand the cost of paradise, right? Yeah, like, the commoners <laughs> loved him, but everyone else thought he was an, a, a really bad guy. Yeah, you don't cross him. Yeah, and, Sounds... you know, the Ace and I certainly didn't like him. No. Since he, you know, them. waged a war on, on the White Tower. And something um, that also kind of occurred to me, like, as we were getting prepped for the episode, is that I think part of the prejudice we get against Ace and I comes out of this whole, like, Otto Harkwing was so prejudiced because he was oh, the leader okay. of this grand empire. You know, just like just like Constantine adopts Christianity and now the rest of the world has been impacted by that. I think Otto uh-huh. Harkwing's like his disdain for Aesodai kind of carries into the rest of the world too. That might be part yeah, of Yeah, especially if the common people loved him, they would have been like, oh, well, then the Aesodai must be horrible. He that says makes, so, yeah, so, yeah. That, yeah. that actually makes sense. I didn't think about that. Hmm. And that brings us up to chapter 30. But first, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode of the Wheel of Time Pod There is brought to you by Elias Machira's Motivational Speaking Need some motivation to get moving? Elias is what you're looking for He'll harass and harangue you into action No problem Underneath that gruff exterior is even more gruffness Elias Machira Motivational Speaking Well, that's one way to do it Chapter 30 is called Children of Shadow And the icon is the Sunburst Perrin goes off by himself to brood over his axe, but Elias follows him and calls him out for being a dumbass. He tells Perrin that Egwin would have wanted a clean death and to let it go, but Perrin can't do that. He tells Elias that he hates the axe and wants to throw it away, but Elias stops him, saying that as long as he hates it, he'll make good use of it. When the day comes that he no longer hates it, that's when he should throw it away. 
Perrin's mopiness is interrupted by an urgent sending from the wolves. A large party of men on horseback is heading their way, and Dapple says that they smell wrong, like a rabid dog. Elias leaves to join the wolves and tells Perrin and Egwin to hide. Perrin sees another piece of the ruined statue and thinks it'll be a good place to hide. He notices that Egwin and Bella are having a hard time seeing and realizes that full dark has set, yet he can still see pretty well. They take shelter in Hawkwing's hand, and Perrin senses that the wolves are being persistently hunted by men with torches, and they are fighting back. The men are getting closer, and Perrin considers making a run for it, but it is too late. They are discovered. They climb down to surrender, and Perrin sees that the men are children of the light. One of the white cloaks threatens Perrin with a lance, and out of nowhere, Hopper comes to rescue Perrin, killing the man. The white cloaks kill Hopper, which enrages Perrin, who gives in to the wolf inside and attacks the men, killing two of them before he is knocked unconscious. When he wakes up, he is in the White Cloak camp, where he and Egwin are bound and prisoners. They meet Lord Captain Jaffram Bornhold, who is in charge of this camp, and Child Byer, who we will be stuck with for the rest of the series, so get comfy. Byer tallies up the casualties of the evening, nine dead, 23 injured, and 30 hamstrung horses, and estimates that they were attacked by a planned ambush of 50 wolves and at least a dozen dark friends. But Bornhold knows that is a gross overestimation. Bornhold asks Perrin and Egwin for their story and says that he is giving them a chance to convince him that they are not dark friends, but every word they say has the opposite effect and digs them in deeper. Byer wants to just kill them, but Bornhold says that no one is so far gone to the shadow that they can't come back to the light. He wants to give Egwin the chance to repent. Perrin, however, since he killed two white cloaks, will be sentenced to death. So before we get into this chapter, uh, the title, Children of Shadow, is really interesting since this yeah. is a chapter about the children of light. Right. It seems like this is Jordan's way of subtly telling us that the children are essentially evil, even though they don't follow the dark one. They're so blinded by their self-righteousness that they have become a corrupted thing. Is that subtle? Well, I mean, well, it depends on if you pay attention to true. titles. <laughs> if you pay attention to titles, you're right. Which, if you're reading through the first time, you probably don't. Yeah. But yeah. the second time through, you find a lot more. Or, you know, <laughs> if you're doing a podcast and bring it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, um, honestly, I don't know that I have noticed the title until this read-through. Oh, okay. All right. So the way Elias talks cracks me up, which I've said. Um, when he's uh, talking to Perrin about killing Egwin, um, he says, you were ready to kill her because you despise her, always dragging her feet, holding you back with her womanish ways. Oy. <laughs> <laughs> like just that phrase, womanish ways. It just makes me laugh. <laughs> well done, Elias. Well done. Well, well done. Well, because he's wow. being so sarcastic yeah. in the moment. You yeah. Know? Like, the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. know. It just it made me laugh. I think we all need more Eliases in our life. Mm, maybe not. But, but not a lot of them. <laughs> just maybe one. <laughs> um, Parents' central struggle over the axe starts here in this chapter. Mm -hmm. um, he hates it and what he is capable of doing with it. Yeah. Um, he wants to throw it away, but Elias stops him. He says that as long as he hates it, he will use it more wisely than most men would, and that the time to throw it away will be when he no longer hates it. Which is really good advice. Yeah. I mean, and this happens much later on, and it's, I like that Robert Jordan has planted exactly what's going to happen later right here in front of us. Yeah. Um, but I think the fact that it's Elias who says this to him is significant because Elias is one who doesn't have a problem with being violent. Mm -hmm. But he tells Perrin that the time may come when it's time to put the axe aside. And I think to Perrin, it makes it mean that much more. Yeah, that makes sense. So Dapple says that the men smell wrong, like yeah. a rabid dog smells wrong. And that is the perfect description of the White Cloaks. They are rabid. Like, their zealotry is so severe that they're basically mad. Like, they're completely crazy. Yeah. Um, and in their madness, they're as dangerous and destructive and as deadly as a rabid dog. So they hide um, when the men are coming. And I just, I like the poetry 
of taking shelter in Otter Hawkwing's hand. Yeah. Like that's just such a lovely image. Because that's know? all that's that's all that's really exposed left of the statue is that big piece of hand. Right. right. But considering, you know, who Hawkwing was, it just it's it's so beautiful, the imagery of it. Yeah. You know? So Piran's wolf senses are really starting to kick in here. Mm -hmm. Um, His eyesight and and his sense of smell are are heightened. And he, like they're seen around in the dark and he realizes it for the first time that, wait, I can see. Yeah, he levels up. And like his eyesight and his sense of smell come in so handy throughout the rest of the series. Yep. Like once he finally understands what's happening, um, especially with the sense of smell, like once he starts to be able to interpret what it means. Yes. Like it is so helpful. Because he can read a room. Well, he can yeah. S- because he can smell a room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, so when Egwin tells Perrin that they'll be all right and asks him to dance with her when they get home, mm. she isn't just trying to comfort him. She's telling him, look, I know things are really weird right now and you got this wolf thing happening to you. But you are still just parent to me, and we're going to get through this together. And yeah. it's just, it's, it's very sweet. It's a very sweet moment between the two of them. It's a great gesture. Yeah. Um, so much goes on in this whole thing. Like, like we get, Perrin connects with the wolves in a way that he can actually track the white cloves movements because he can sense them through the wolves. Right. Um, but he also gets a very, a faint awareness of where Elias is. Yeah. Um, which is kind of cool. Um, Perrin also runs into this thing where he has a sensation of blood in his mouth as the wolves take out individual people. Yeah, like he's so in the wolves' minds that it's... Uh, Visceral. Yeah. Yeah, which is kind of cool Gross, and weird, but, cool. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. And then when Hopper, fa- when Hopper dies here saving their lives, a sacrifice, um, he actually feels Hopper die. Mm-hmm. Like he feels the pain of it. So he's he's so deeply connected to the wolves in this com- chapter that it's it's actually really I mean it's horrific, but it's also very cool. Yeah. So Hopper. <laughs> oh Hopper. Um, your first time through reading this, I think Robert Jordan has done a pretty good job of um, marking Hopper out, yeah. like giving him characteristics so that you actually care. But it's not until subsequent reads after you've seen what happens with Hopper throughout the rest of the series that it really gets you. You know, yeah. like like this was kind of sad and painful the first time, but coming back to it, it hurts so bad. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I tweeted something on, on Twitter this week and Rafe Judkins was asking for lines that people want to make sure are in that first, you know, season of the world uh-huh. time show. Yeah. And I just put Hopper's line, one of Hopper's lines on here. And like everybody in Twitter was just like, Oh, 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 you, my the knife, feels. my heart. Oh, everybody was upset by that, but in a good way. But yeah. So I just want to read the death scene. Basically. I just, I want to read the whole section. Like I indulge me. This is happening. <laughs> Out of the night, Hopper came and Perrin was one with the wolf. Hopper, the cub who had watched the eagles soar and wanted so badly to fly through the sky as the eagles did. The cub who hopped and jumped and leapt until he could leap higher than any other wolf and who never lost the cub's yearning to soar through the sky. Out of the night, Hopper came and left the ground in a leap, soaring like the eagles. The white cloaks had only a moment to begin cursing before Hopper's jaws closed on the throat of the man with his lance leveled at Perrin. The big wolf's momentum carried them both off the other side of the horse. Perrin felt the throat crushing, tasted the blood. Hopper landed lightly, already apart from the man he had killed. Blood matted his fur, his own blood and that of others. A gash down his face crossed the empty socket where his left eye had been. His good eye met Perrin's too for just an instant. Run, brother! He whirled to leap again, to soar one last time, and a lance pinned him to the earth. A second length of steel thrust through his ribs, driving into the ground under him. Kicking, he snapped at the shafts that held him to soar. Which, of course, reminds me of I am a leaf on the wind. Watch how I soar. Oh, you had to. Oh. <laughs> I mean, way we already, too soon. We already way had the feels. Soon. I might as well add more feels. 
<laughs> that movie came out what ten years ago? It is too soon. <laughs> oh, if you if you don't know what we're talking about, watch Firefly, and then watch, and then watch the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, leaf on the wind. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> Perrin wakes up bound in the tent because they knock him out, and right. uh, <laughs> we meet our first high ranking member of the Children of the Light. Ooh. Lord Captain Bornhold. <sighs> okay, so it's interesting how Jordan sets him up and describes him as a grandfather. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, okay, um, maybe we have some hope. We, we see this grandfatherly figure. He's going to interrogate us. Maybe it's not going to go so bad. Hmm. But then we realize, oh, this is the children of the light. Right. Um, so, of course, it's going to go horribly. It's horrible. It really is. Um, but one thing that comes out here is, so we see a definite difference in attitude and the behavior of Bornhold and child buyer. Mm -hmm. And on the surface, Bornhold seems more sane and less of a bad guy than buyer. And Mm -hmm. by the the problem is that he never stops buyer's harsh treatment of Perrin and Negwin. Right. He condemns, he condones everything that buyer does. Yeah. And when he does call buyer out, for overestimating the attack, it's in an indulgent way that says that he'll learn better with time. It's it, he is just as bad as Buyer, maybe worse because his mind doesn't seem as twisted as Buyer's. Yeah. So Bornhold acts like he should know better, which makes him so much more insidious as a character. Absolutely. So when Buyer is giving the. Uh, summary of the night's events. Yeah. He uh, says, it is unlikely we will find any bodies given the dark friend's propensity for carrying away their dead to hide their losses. <laughs> well, isn't that convenient? Right. Like, they have all these little uh, stories and traditions and, and uh, ways of imagining the dark friends act to like explain how wrong they are about everything. Right. Because, yeah. Because <sighs> why would you need proof when you can just explain it away? Right. You know, it's what we believe, not what's actually true. <laughs> um, there's still a difference to the level of zeal that Bornhold has as opposed to Child Buyer. Right. Um, and they're equally convinced that the children are the ultimate moral authority in the world. Mm-hmm. And Dark Friends are not worthy of basic human dignity. Yeah. So Child Buyer... Is a sociopath. Right. Like, full-on DSM-5, antisocial personality disorder, (laughs) lacks empathy, and has maladaptive behavior, sociopath. Right. Like, the the way he is described how, um, you know, having, like, talking about them being killed, like, it's nothing. and, And Perrin says, you know, there's no malice in it. There's no joy in it. Um, it's just, it's nothing to him talking like, about torturing them or killing them. It, it means nothing. Like he has no human emotion. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is what happens when instead of getting treatment, a person like this is put in an environment where those disordered parts are allowed to flourish and grow. Yeah. Like child buyer is a sociopath and it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, and I don't think all of the children of the light are written this way. Right. Um, in fact, I mean, you look at Dane Bornhold and he's a little too emotional. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I'm not saying that all of the children are like this, but Bayer specifically, as we see him over and over again throughout the series, Mm -hmm. like he is clinically not okay. And he's been put in a situation like environment where it's encouraged. Where, yeah, like they want him to be that way. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that Bornhold knows that the Wolf Brothers return uh, is a sign of the last battle being near. Like it kind of yeah, comes out of nowhere, and like it's random, especially because he considers wolves to be creatures of the Dark One. Right. Like I thought that was kind of out of left field. Um. But um, I love the description that Perrin has of what it's like to be waking up after being knocked out. It says, his brain still felt like jellied pain. Jellied pain. It's a great image, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, jellied pain. 
So Bornhold chides Beyer for not wanting to give Perrin and Egwin their possessions back. Mm-hmm. Um, and what, what he says is, or are you one of those who have taken to looting the unenlightened child buyer? It's a bad business that, yes, no man can be a thief and walk in the light. Buyer seems to struggle with this belief of the suggestion. <laughs> so this is the first indication that there's a bit of a rift in the children in the light. Mm-hmm. Th- they're, they're, both of these sides are deplorable, but some are like Bornhold and actually hold true to their guiding principles of bringing the light to those who are not enlightened. Mm-hmm. Um, others are like Buyer. Rabid dogs that would find it easier to kill you for being a dark friend rather than waste the time to confirm it first. Mm-hmm. So we'll see this play out through the rest of the series in various different ways. But this is the first indication that we get that there are two schools of thought among the children of the light. Yeah. So. The white cloaks just make me so angry. Yeah. Because they're religious zealots who are trying to govern morality. And because morality is so subjective, once they get, like, a modicum of power or authority, there's no stopping them. They can falsely accuse left and right, and they create all sorts of crazy laws that further their own power because anyone who opposes them, they just claim dark friend. And it just, this, this right here, this is why (laughs) there needs to be separation between church and state. Yes. Like, our laws are not based on morality. They're based on what's best for society. Like, for example, murder is illegal, not because murder is wrong, but because if we let our citizens murder each other, it's bad for, for society, society as a whole. Right. And of course, murder is wrong, but that's not the point. And I realize that this is a very American perspective. Like, for other countries who have absolute monarchs, like, there's a certain uh, belief system of like divine right. And I'm not right. like, if you live in a country who has that system, I'm not harsh in your system. Like this is just my perspective, but I personally believe that morality and government should not intertwine because it's too easy to be corrupted. And it always ends in tears. Like the white cloaks more than anyone else in this series, even more than the Asa die who are yeah. completely messed yes. up are horribly corrupted. It's just a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. It hasn't worked. If you look throughout history, it never, ever works. Yeah. I'm going to stop ranting now. (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, it's not like the people from Western societies have, like, crusades to look back on as an example, you know. Yeah. Or, you know, a Spanish Inquisition. I mean. I mean, hell, look back to Reagan times. Yeah. It never works. It just never works. It never does. So, on that... Uh, let's let's take a very cautious approach to uh, <laughs> religion in the wheel of time. Um, oh, okay. Because they're, you're, they're, for me, as a person who studied a uh, biblical study major, you know, Christian ministry major, that was my that was my field of study in college. Mm-hmm. I look at the wheel of time, and I don't really see it as being very religious at all. There are there are not any flat out stated religions. The white mm-hmm. cloaks are the closest thing we get. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Like, I don't think that there's necessarily a religion in Randland. Right. Um, I mean, they talk about the light and they talk about the creator, but I don't really think it's a religion, except for the white cloaks and then uh, the prophet later right, on. later on. And in both of those instances, that's more of a cult. Um, but I definitely think that the white cloaks have raised the light into a form of religion. Like Mm -hmm. it's militarized, which is really messed up, but I do see them as a religious sect. Um, And again, (laughs) you should not mix your government and your morality because they um, rule uh, Amadasia. Yes. Uh, Like there's a king, but they control the king basically He's a puppet because king. they basically rule this country. Um, like it just, it's, it's so messed up. And for some reason they have the authority to wander around yep. the world. Um, like th- they take people and declare their authority to take them and torture them and, and, and kill them. And it's like, how is that legal? 
Right. And it's, you know, mm-hmm. when you're a military might, when you're a military power, like, it's... Just whoever has the strongest military, yeah. Right. Like, it doesn't fly in Camelin because the Queen's Guard is stronger than the yeah. White Cloaks. The Queen would rally an army to kick them out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, they go to the smaller countries who don't quite have the military might, and all of a sudden, they're the law of the land, yep. and it's completely screwed up. Like, and again, you will see this again with the prophet, which is, uh, I think, even more blatantly cultish behavior. Yeah. Um, so, going back to the question of is there a religion in the Wheel of Time, I don't think that all of Ranland has a religion, but I do specifically think the White Cloaks and the prophet are religious cults. Right. And to be clear, like when I say religion, I mean like there's an actual like sh- there's an actual structured organized like belief system with, you know, a set of set of rules, set of dogma, and, and, yeah. yeah. I mean, we do we do see like Shinarians like will say things like, you know, made the final embrace of the mother like like there there's these traditions and these rituals when people die that, that but they're just phrases. They're not actually yeah. wrapped in like ceremony or or, or there's no temples like or anything ordinances like that. or things yeah. like that. Yeah, they don't. They have traditions, but they don't necessarily have the, the structure that makes a religion. Yeah, but the white cloaks and the prophet, people of the prophet, do uh, right because they're a power structure of organized people around a set of beliefs. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we, now I think we've very successfully skirted around that. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about religion is always a really great thing to do. It gets people so happy and willing to like just you know share openly about each other. Yes, but if they've been playing our drinking game by this point, they're really, yeah. really drunk. Because yeah. we said Raven a, a lot. lot. <laughs> do another one. Okay, so <laughs> that brings us to the ends of chapter twenty nine and thirty of the Eye of the World. In next week's episode, we will cover chapters 31 and 32, where we travel with Rand and Matt, and we share in their ups and downs on the journey towards Camelin. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Wheel of Time pod through. We'll see you again next week. Make sure that you rate and subscribe to us on iTunes or Spotify or, or wherever you catch your podcasts. Um, maybe leave us a positive review. It really helps us out as we get like put in the recommended podcasts and things like that. Um, you can tweet us. Any of your thoughts or questions or comments at uh, WattPodThrough or email us at WattPodThrough at gmail.com. Tell us your thoughts on anything we covered today. That's W-O-T-P-O-D-T-H-R-U at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, and we hope the will weaves you in our direction again soon.